Hello everyone, I'm Chris Sullivan and I'll be your host for our 13th and final installment of the Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Risk Management Webinar Series for 2020. We've covered a wide, wide, wide range of topics this year based on what you've told us you want to hear more about, ranging from parametric solutions for wind, earthquake, and hail to emerging risks, alternative risk strategies for a hard market, non-damage business interruption, leveraging technology to achieve better results in your international programs, virtual captives, mitigating insurance fraud with technology, and de-risking global supply chains. By the way, all these sessions have been recorded and are available to you on the Swiss Re Corporate Solutions events webpage. Today, we conclude with the tyranny of data, which will explore the risks around artificial intelligence through the, through the lens of a technologist and a cyber risk engineer. Just a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. You'll see a question feature that will allow you to enter questions throughout the presentation, which will only be visible to me and the presenters. Of course, all lines have been muted, and if you encounter any technology issues, please press Control F5 to refresh the platform. Our speakers today will be Jerry Gupta, a technologist and data scientist, and Kurt Ostreicher, a cyber risk engineer. Jerry Gupta is an executive with experience leading data science and technology initiatives. At Swiss Re, he leads the tech-enabled data-driven innovation with a goal of developing new products and taking them to market. Previously, he was the global head of program management at Amazon and launched the innovation and venture groups at Liberty Mutual. Jerry has an MBA from MIT Sloan, an MS in data science from Northwestern, and an MS in computer science from Bentley University. Kurt Ostreicher, is a senior cyber risk engineer for Swiss Re Corporate Solutions with the primary role of developing global engineering services in support of cyber insurance products. He has over 25 years of experience in the cybersecurity, cyber insurance, intelligence, national security, and aviation fields. Kurt began his career as an aviation and intelligence officer while serving with the U.S. Army and has also held positions as special agent with the FBI Director of Digital Forensics and Unmanned Aircraft Operations with Travelers Insurance and International Pilot for American Airlines. He has an MS in Digital Forensics and has assessed the cybersecurity programs of over 75 Fortune 500 companies. Now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to Jerry and Kurt. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, in, in this webinar, as Chris pointed out, Kurt and I will be talking about uh, the risks posed by AI. And we, we will try to do it in a manner where we contextualize what artificial intelligence is, uh, what the current state is, what the potential risks are, and then we'll also uh, provide some, um, some mitigation strategies uh, on the risk posed by AI. Uh, before we get into um, the uh, before we get into the uh, the meat of the presentation, uh, I am presenting to you a questionnaire or, or a poll. So, so the question I want to pose to you before I start is, how do you think AI will impact us? Will it make decision making transparent or unbiased? Do you think AI will make humans redundant? Do you think it will make humans more productive? Or do you think it will make decision-making more opaque? Uh, reality is, it's probably more than one correct answer, but I, I'm gonna request you to use like one answer. Uh, I'll give you 15 seconds. Okay, I think uh, most of you would have submitted the answers by now. So let's go ahead. So, okay, so let's see. Most of you think it will make decision-making more opaque, followed by more productive and increased revenue and employment. Uh, most of you are very optimist, and only a few of you think it will make humans redundant. And also, a lot of you are... Uh, thinking that it will make decision-making more transparent based. Okay, so, so this is good. It, it is not, um, 
unlike some of the more recent polls we have done, uh, which obviously, uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's a trend. Uh, we saw a whole lot of different answers uh, earlier in the year and last year. And so it looks like uh, a lot of you have become more positive <laughs> over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, but this is definitely not outside of the um, the norm. So, so thank you for taking this poll. So, so I ask this question because, you know, um, all of these questions are somewhat related to the talking points we have over the course of the next 40, 45 minutes. So, uh, you know, if, if you look at where, so if, let's, let's contextualize what AI is. Um, you know, when, when we think of AI uh, and when we think of ML in our regular day-to-day -day parlance, we sort of confuse the two. We, we use the words interchangeably, but in the data science world, artificial intelligence and machine learning have specific meaning. Uh, machine learning actually is a subset of artificial intelligence. And, and what we think of arti artificial intelligence is, uh, is, is a, uh, it's a set of cognitive functions and cognitive and quote unquote functions that machines have that mimic the human learning and problem solving, right? So uh, artificial intelligence is not the native intelligence or natural intelligence displayed by human beings, at least not yet. But what it does do is it seeks to mimic how humans think, or at least how, at least mimic or replicate the decisions humans make. And machine learning is simply a subset of that where uh, uh, machines have a self-learning or reinforcement mechanism where they are evolving and learning on their own. Uh, th that's the, the definition at least I have and, and which I talked about. Kurt, I don't know if you, if you, if you, if you have the same definition or, or you have some nuance to it? No, absolutely. Thanks, Jerry. And I, and I think as we're looking at, at these and specifically around artificial intelligence, <laughs> it runs the gamut from what we consider or, or what the term is narrow AI uh, all, all the way to more general AI. And when we think about narrow AI, we're talking about very, very, you know, weak AI. Sometimes it's even known as weak AI. And, and it's, what that is, it's just the artificial intelligence is very good at performing a single task. So think of it like an if-then statement, right? So it could be something very, you know, as, as simple as maybe a, a mimicking a, a human tax accountant, right, who takes the information you provide runs it against the tax rules, and then gives you your tax bill, right? So it can be very, very simplified, all the way to, you know, think about like the C-3PO in Star Wars in, in basically a human level of intelligence. So we have the full gamut. And so as we think about this going forward, we're in the very early stages of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Perfect. And, and Kurt, one of the things that we are seeing, at least in the technology-driven or, or, or um, uh, born uh, digital companies or native digital companies is uh, they're starting to deploy AI in a manner that is significantly different from what we're seeing in legacy companies. So, uh, you know, what we saw maybe, uh, what we're seeing uh, now, what we saw five, 10 years ago was machines would look at human actions and human decisions and they would mimic those. They would be able to replicate them, right? So basically they still needed to be trained uh, on, on a lot of human decisions. They would they could replicate the output to the same extent or better than humans, but you still, but they, they couldn't, you couldn't really teach them anything new. What we are seeing now is they're actually starting to learn the rules themselves. So you don't really need to, so, so for example, if you take the example of the game AlphaGo, uh, in the first iteration, it, it, it looked at the different strategies employed by humans and it, and it basically optimized the strategies. Now, what machines are doing, they just know, they just learn the rules of the game. And they're coming up with brand new strategies that humans have not even thought of, right? So that's the, uh, that's a new piece that's starting to come out that we haven't seen in the past. From an insurance point of view, and, and in your experience, Kurt, uh, is that something that you're seeing as well? Absolutely. And I think as we talk about maybe a, a decade ago, or maybe even a little bit longer than that, you, you talk about the algorithms that are human constructed that are building you know, the foundations of the machine learning, right? And so as we talk about the machine learning and the AI bias and, and so on uh, throughout this presentation, 
you know, the, the early stages was just that, right? You were relying on humans to program this, and uh, the machine learning is attempting to optimize those algorithms to achieve a predefined objective, right? To minimize errors, maximize successes, and so on. Um, and to your example, I mean, it's, so an example of this might be learning to play chess, where it's, you know, it's trying to optimize the, the human-given algorithms. But then I think we start talking about what's happened really in the last, uh, in just the last decade or so is this deep learning, which is, uh, it's really a subset of machine learning and it's, it's used to describe kind of the artificial, you know, neural networks that were very, very deep. And it, it takes it to a much higher level with higher accuracy um, and much more hardware and training time. But it can perform these exceptionally well on, on both unstructured data uh, and things like images and text. So we start thinking about image recognition, facial recognition, um, analyzing unstructured data and through, through, um, through documents and so on. That's kind of where we're at now. And then really the, the general AI, which is where the, the machines start to program their own algorithms, right? They start to reason, plan, solve problems, kind of think abstractly, uh, comprehend complex ideas, they learn from experience, that's, you know, the projections for that are five to 50 years out, right, in terms of that level. So we're just starting to scratch the surface um, of the artificial uh, general intelligence and, and really the, the deep learning is only something that's been able to, to happen in the last, you know, few years simply because of the comp computational power required to, to handle that. Absolutely. And, 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 and Kurt, you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned uh, narrow versus, uh, 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 narrow and specific. So, so uh, in the same way, right? We, we have the weak and the strong AI. One of the things, obviously, uh, 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 people still don't sort of um, understand well is what are the areas where AI is is applicable and where it has uh, shown progress and success. And and uh, one of the things that we always talk about. Um, um, when we talk to clients and when we do, when we launch projects is, you know, successful AI deployment, it still um, uh, uh, has a very, you know, it, it's not as widespread as you might think. And, um, uh, you know, for, for AI to be, or an AI project to be successful, the problem statement has to be still fairly narrow. It, it's, it can be broad, right? So, uh, you, you, you. So, so one of the things we do is we say, come to us with problem statement or use cases, and let's just break it down into subcomponents and try to solve each component uh, uh, individually, as opposed to trying to solve everything at one go, which, which most likely is going to result in failure. So, you know, the right conceptual problem development uh, and conceptual problem statement. Excuse me. So, so we are still at a stage where, however strong AI is. Uh, in, 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 in technical parlance, we still call it weak AI. Uh, we, we are still not seeing um, uh, uh, deployment or use of AI in, 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 in a very broad or general purpose situation. Uh, so, so uh, you know, same point as you were making, Kurt, uh, earlier as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the concept of AI has been around for, for actually a very long time. I mean, it's, it's gone back to, I believe, the 50s is where it was first coined. And, and then you see some of the AI risks where you talk about algorithmic risk and so on. Uh, I think the first case of a, of, a, of a human homicide that was attributed to AI was back in 1981, where, where the system was, was programmed uh, to remove a blockage, right? The artificial intelligence on the assembly line identified a, one of the employees as a system blockage that was preventing the machine from completing its objective. And through its AI, it calculated that the most efficient way to deal with that blockage was to push it out of the way. In that case, to push the, the person into a grinding machine, right? And then continued on with its, with its duties. So I think that, you know, the, the history of, of weak AI or narrow AI has been around for a very long time. And you look at where we're using it today, uh, it's certainly exponentially um, more complex than it was, where you think about algorithmic trading on Wall Street, where bots are carrying out, you know, buying stocks and bonds, or uh, you have algorithmic credit scoring or algorithmic uh, surveillance, which is using computer vision analysis and voice recognition, uh, algorithmic healthcare. Uh, which is determining whether or not you see a specialist or whether your insurance claims approved or not. You have algorithmic warfare. 
um, where you know drones and other robots have the capability to define, target, and kill without human intervention. And then you even have, of course, algorithmic dating, right? So I think it's it's kind of runs the gamut of industries. And I think from an insurance standpoint, as we're looking at this uh, internally from a risk perspective, it, it gets really complex because as we're looking at companies that are traditional in the tech space, um, so think of uh, you know Google, for example, that's very heavily into the um, image recognition and so on that are now uh, partnering with some of these hospitals and, and other health institutes to to use imagery for, for you know, scanning MRIs and those types of things. Is, is it truly a technology company? Are we starting to get into things, uh, areas such as medical malpractice, for example? So as, as it's kind of creeping along and we, use, we see the blending of this technology into the traditional, uh, into the other traditional spaces, it, it becomes much more complex risk, right? Yeah, and, and you know the other thing to add here is uh, even though we call it weak AI, uh, which is narrow and specific AI, uh, it's still pretty powerful. We still haven't gone through all the use cases. So, for you know the studies show 50% of the businesses haven't realized any value out of AI. So uh, it's not because AI doesn't provide or add any value. It's just that they haven't used it right. Uh, so and and the other piece that was really surprising that I, I read recently is. Um, you know, uh, for the businesses that did deploy AI, uh, a vast majority of them uh, saw value in more complex things or more risky things like revenue generation or revenue enhancement as opposed to simpler things like cost reduction, right? So, um, so, so just because we're calling it weak AI doesn't mean it's not powerful, doesn't mean it doesn't add a lot of value. So, now let's come to the current state where we are, and 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 you know so throughout this presentation I will try to break this into people, process, technology, and I'll, I'll also try to provide uh, sort of an insurance um, uh, sort of framework around it or, or insurance point of view. So if you look at the current state uh, from a people, process, technology point of view, uh, what we are seeing is for people point of view, uh, some of the AI areas where AI is being deployed. Um, it is already exceeding um, uh, the skill level of humans, up to 80% of humans, right? So, so we're already seeing uh, a, a, a pretty broad impact of AI on which have traditionally been skills-based or, or intellect-based jobs, uh, white-collar jobs. So that's, that's already starting to happen, <laughs> and that trend will definitely accelerate. From a technology point of view, also, uh, one trend is very clear, which is, the world is getting segregated between the technology haves and the technology haves not. And, and uh, the technology haves, which tend to be the big tech right now, are really uh, accelerating the pace of innovation, the pace of growth, and, 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 and widening the chasm between themselves and the rest of the world. And, and, and I think from an insurance point of view, this is one area where we have to sit back and we have to say, what, what, what exactly is happening in the insurance value chain? And, and we'll get to slide 13 where we talk about the impact of AI on insurance, but, but that, that really is something that we as insurance professionals, we have to sit back and we have to evaluate what exactly are we doing, which value are we providing, and how do we uh, stem this erosion of, of, of sort of our value accretive business. And, and the final piece is process. And the process piece is important here, especially from the AI risk perspective, because um, a lot of the world, the technology-driven world, uh, is, 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 is built upon the open source or uh, the API or SDK-driven world, right? And so what happens when you build upon those foundations is you, to a certain extent, you lose control of some of your quality control and other processes because you are taking code that has been exposed, built by someone else, uh, you might do quality control on it and all of those things, but you still are using an underlying foundational element of your technology stack uh, that you haven't, you, you really haven't looked under the hood. Uh, and, and so there is that, um, uh, you know, we call it the code risk or the code quality risk uh, that we are starting to see more and more companies uh, and businesses uh, sorry, companies and 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 uh, board of directors get concerned about because uh, you know think about this way: a, a digital company is uh, the foundations of a digital company is the underlying code, and if the underlying code is suspect, then then you you sort of have to worry about 
uh, the edifice that's been built on top of that. So that's definitely something that, uh, you know, um, we are looking into as Swissry, but also um, uh, we are starting to see more startups emerge in the space to, to look at that specific risk. Um, uh, Kurt, any, any comments on this? <clears throat> no, absolutely. And just trying to piggyback on that, the the do-it-yourself AI, or I mean, it's not even really AI, it's really evolved around the whole concept of open source. I mean, nobody builds software from scratch anymore. Uh, so you're really re relying on these libraries of open source code to, to build your platforms. And if you think about the complexity of an AI platform, uh, you're talking about millions and millions of lines of code and the potential for there to be some type of, of just coding error in there. Uh, there's, there's no way to, to properly go through every single line of code and make sure that, that there's no error. And you have to think outside the box. I mean, it's, in this space, is, is different from traditional you know, software engineering and so on, where you really have to think about how are we training these models? And we're going to get into the bias risk a little bit uh, you know, in a few slides here. But you, know, you think back to um, kind of the IBM Watson in the earlier days where it, was, it, it learned, um, it started using profane language after it had scanned the Urban Dictionary website, right? Or you look at the, the Microsoft bot a few years back, I think it was 2015 or 16, uh, Tay, that, that um, you know, was out on Twitter and it was supposed to be a Twitter chat bot emulating a teenage girl. And you know the Twitter users start flooding, uh, you know, commenting with a bunch of racial and uh, other, you know, not appropriate comments, and it, it trained the bot to respond. And so all of a sudden, Microsoft had their own bot was now re replying to the Twitter sphere with with racial slurs and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mean, companies have to really start thinking about what what does this mean when we release these these technologies, and 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 it's beyond just your simple coding. These these machines, once they're released, start to learn on their own, right? And so we have to be aware of what, what are the limits, what, what safeguards or guardrails are we putting in place to kind of keep it from going down those paths. Yeah, and I think the key takeaway here is um, AI is powerful, AI is pervasive, uh, but it's also dumb, right? It doesn't have the judgment uh, that a human being has. So if you feed it garbage, it will not have the human judgment to to discard the garbage, it will incorporate the garbage into its decision making and start making nonsensical outputs. So, so, so that's that's definitely the case. Um, you know, we, we talked about the the technology piece in the previous slide. We talked about how we're creating a world of haves versus have-nots, and 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 it's really important that we as insurance uh, industry really think through what it really means, right? So, just to give an example, Walmart has about 20 billion in revenue. Uh, with an employee base of about two and a half million people. And you compare that with Google. Google has about 30 billion in revenue on an employee base of about 80,000. So if you do a, uh, a capital velocity analysis of this, uh, Google is about 100 times more, more uh, efficient than Walmart, right? And so what we, are, what we are seeing is, you know, legacy companies like ours, legacy industries like ours, like insurance and others, uh, we really do have a large footprint. Uh, we do have a um, uh, we, we do have an infrastructure that's needed to support it. And and what's happening is the digital companies or digital native companies uh, are are not really building. What they're doing is they're, they're being really smart. They're using our our infrastructure and then using their uh, data capabilities to turn our advantages against us. Right. So. In the case of Walmart and, 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 and Amazon, for example, right, uh, same, at the end of the day, same industry, but Amazon doesn't have the physical presence that Walmart does. And, and so it just changes the equation. And so, uh, you know, something as insurance industries, we should, we should be cognizant of, you know, uh, having a physical presence, having the footprint has a value. We have to ask ourselves a question, which is, have we let that value erode too much by following the same processes and paths as additional companies, which fundamentally erodes the value of the physical infrastructure? Sir? <clears throat> No, absolutely. And it's certainly changed. I mean, I'm coming from the risk engineering perspective here and, and the way we assess risks is certainly changing as well. I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, traditional lines of business where you might for, take property, for example, you send property engineers on site to, to do their risk engineering assessments and so on. Uh, I mean, so much of that now is virtualized uh, because so much of the processes are, are now you know, occurring in data centers. 
and so it, you know the, the whole way we're looking at businesses has completely changed. And so we, we find that we're you know when we think about a cyber, so I'm a cyber risk engineer. It's, it's gone far outside the cyber product itself from cyber insurance to all the other traditional lines are now have some type of a cyber exposure because there's so much virtualization that's happening and so much data driven um, from a, be it manufacturing or retail, transportation. I mean, you name the industry, there, there's so much of this going on uh, that's really changed the way, at least at Swiss Re, that, that we're looking at risks. Great. So now um, we'll mo move on to the insurance piece of it, which is how is it impacting insurance, how, how it's impacting all of us. And we'll sort of speed up a little bit here because um, uh, we have about 30 minutes, 35 minutes left. So <clears throat> again, from, from people, process, technology point of view, uh, w w what are the issues we are seeing with AI, right? From a people point of view, uh, what is concerning from our perspective is uh, there is a unreasonable level of trust people have in data. Uh, data, as we know, is, is not unbiased. There's no such thing as unbiased data, but uh, people un have an unreasonable trust in data. Uh, while at the same time, um, the, the, uh, you know, think about AI. AI is making decisions for us, right? Uh, be it our college admissions, be it mortgage decisions, be it insurance decisions. So it is making decisions while it is not accountable, right? So think about it, you know, um, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, they make life decisions, and because they make life decisions, they have a code of ethics. They're held to a higher standard. We data scientists are not held to, uh, to that, that kind of standard, even though we are making life-altering decisions. So one of the things that we are really promoting and we are working on very hard is a code of ethics for data scientists, and, and we'll see some movement in that in the coming uh, months. Um, from a process point of view, um, you know, we are in a regulated industry. Uh, we need a high level of confidence in the models we are building. We need to be able to know why a model is making the decision it is making. But unfortunately, we, we are moving in the world where models are becoming more and more complex, right? Uh, we like to have simpler models, but the fact is uh, some of the insure techs, we, insure techs we are dealing with, the big techs we are dealing with, they are not always limited by the uh, by the uh, regulations or limitations we have. And, and so we are having to catch up and we are also starting to build more complex models, which is a big risk because if, if we are deploying complex models, uh, but we don't know the exact reason why each and every decision is being, being, uh, being made, that is a huge amount of risk. And, and that, in my mind, uh, is going to be, uh, you know, uh, Kurt has always spoken about cyber risk, but, but besides the cyber risk, the AI risk, the decision-making bias risk, uh, poor decision of AI, uh, th that will be one of the biggest risks uh, in the next 20 years. And, and, and from a tech perspective, um, the, the effects of AI bias, the effects of, um, of, of models are exacerbated because, you know, we are to a certain extent even losing control of the data because a lot of the world is, is, is networked right now and the model, you know, are picking, picking up data from disparate sources without any human involvement. And so the, the models are, are learning things, picking up data, and, and we have lost control. I think of it as, as, as your child, you know, uh, when, when your child is in your home environment, uh, you, are, you have the ability to control what kind of inputs the child is receiving, what television channels, and all of those things. But, but imagine a situation where your child is receiving inputs from all sorts of sources, online, offline, you have no control over it. So you can imagine the kind of effect it has on your child. And, and you can think of AI in the same perspective where we run the risk. Actually, we don't run the risk. We, we have the de facto risk where we are losing control of the underlying AI decision making. Kurt? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly a huge issue. And then the other thing that we're concerned about, and it's the same thing that we looked at, you know, when we go back, you know, several years when everybody's worried about the emerging IoT, I mean, it's still a big issue with the industry of uh, Internet of Things and, and so on. Um, with this just rush to market, right, there's so much drive to get these products out right now and, and to be kind of at, at the lead and not be left behind. So in that rush, very often the quality control goes out the window. It's, it's not as thorough in vetting these, these algorithmic risks as, as you might otherwise have. 
Jerry and Kurt, we had a question come in from the audience that I think now would be a great time to, to discuss. So how do you put certain rules in place to stop the AI machine acting unethically or inappropriately? Rules that the machine is not allowed to break or circumvent, for example. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll come to that if, if, uh, if Chris, if, if, if you allow us to. Uh, uh, we, we have frameworks that we'll present in the end. Um, uh, we're also working on products in that space. So uh, we, we will talk about mitigation strategies, uh, and, and I, I think what we'll do is we'll accelerate the next set of slides so we get to that quickly. Excellent. Kurt, you want to talk through this slide? Yeah, no, I, I think that the the impact on this insurance value change is certainly is certainly a it's certainly something that we're looking at and certainly it's something that we're concerned about. I think we looked at earlier on, we talked about how we're assessing our risks and how that's changed from maybe a boots on the ground to more virtualization. I think, you know, we're like any other industry now where we're relying more and more on modeling algorithms. I mean, it's not certainly not anything that's new to the insurance industry um, when you look at actuarial data and so on going back generations. But I think that we're the, the pool of data that, that we are now looking at as an industry is growing. I mean, the, the types of data that we're looking at now that's available to us when we're assessing risk is just exponential. And then the problem, I think, to your earlier point, is that it's garbage in, garbage out. So you can actually have so much data being fed into these models and you start to lose control over it, what's actually reliable data sourcing and, and just the quality control of the data itself, the, the origination data, uh, starts to become become problematic because if you don't have good starting data, it can really mess up your algorithms and kind of, the, again, the garbage in, garbage out. So I think that is that is a huge concern. And, you know, as we talk about it, I think you're going to get into it a little bit more specific here with the algorithmic risk and just making sure that the intended outcomes are, are in alignment, right, so that we're not, we're, we're not introducing bias into processes um, where there shouldn't be. Yeah. And, and we'll go through the next few slides really quickly. Uh, basically, as, as, as Kurt pointed out, um, the impact in insurance is deep, but it's not just insurance. You know, it's, it's overall, it's pretty deep. <clears throat> you know, uh, at, a, at an individual level, obviously organizational level, but societal level. And, and again, uh, the risk is not just um, uh, liability or, or, you know, it's also, uh, sorry, risk is not just economic, but also physical and, and, and liability. Um, the the, the um, uh, you know we, we talked uh, you know when we think about industrialization digitalization, uh, digitization uh, the point to remember is you know we've gone through something similar before it just happened 200 years ago when we went through the exercise of replacing our muscle power with machines now we are going through replacing our uh, uh, our our brain power with machines. It just happens to be digital machines. And so one question we have to ask as human beings is, uh, you know, okay, we have, we, we, we have outsourced our body. Now we're outsourcing our mind, what is left, right? Some people say, you know, this, the creative piece of it that's left, other pieces are left. But, but human beings have a limited number of capabilities, right, at the end of the day. And so uh, the question as a society we have to ask is, at what point, uh, how much of ourselves can we outsource uh, before it gets too late. Uh, Kurt, I don't know if you have anything to add here, uh, or we can move to the next slide. No, I think we can move on. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's trying to be cute. It's, it's actually a morbid topic, but, you know, so the question is, is winter coming? And, and, and um, you know, uh, actually, I'll go, to the, uh, uh, I'll go to a poll first. Uh, so I'll go to the next point. And so the question I have for all of you is, you know, based on what you heard Kurt and I talk about the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, which functions uh, in insurance do you think AI will impact the most? I'll give you 10 seconds. All right, we'll move on. Brokers, 100%. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, I think I think I I, I don't think there was there was uh, the the only wrong answer here was none. Uh, but but I, th I think uh, I think it's 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 uh, impacting everything. I mean, we're seeing a lot of straight through processing initiatives and claims. We are also seeing a lot of um, automated underwriting and obviously uh, the brokerage piece. So so yeah. So I, I think I think that's really interesting and apt. Uh, and, and and you know, uh, one question I always get asked is, 
uh, what do you think about the timelines of, of when we're going to see, you know, so, so the initial question that I, got, I, I was asked to solve for Liberty Mutual in 2015 was, when will we see uh, level three uh, auto- autonomous vehicles on the road? And so we did a lot of work on that. And, and, and so I've taken that a step further and I'm saying, when will we see substantially automated systems? So I, I define it in two ca- three categories. Uh, human executed uh, 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 AI, so productive AI, we are already here. The, se- the second piece is uh, human uh, enabled, where human, so interpretive AI, uh, where humans are not executing, but humans are basically um, you know, enabling it. And the third one is human observed, which is human is simply an observer. And, and I tried to correlate that with the Cambrian explosion, which is when life forms came on Earth, and then uh, correlated that with the advent of decimal system, which is a forerunner to the uh, to the mathematics, and which is a forerunner to AI. And and so, if you, if you take the same ratios and the same logic, we're looking at about 25 years. So so that's that's just trying to you know trying to quantitatively answer a question um, uh, using prior experience. And then finally, we come to the opportunity piece, and, and, and this is where I think there were questions around AI, how we can handle them, all of those things. You know, the first piece really is what I call the AQ framework of governance. So we've written a paper on this, hopefully it'll be published next year, <clears throat> where we say, how do we, uh, how, how do we make AI um, um, controlled by human beings, right? And so we say the foundational element are regulations which rests upon the pillar of assessment, audit, and adherence, which leads to insurability and trust, right? So if you, if you look, at, look at it, this is a comprehensive framework where uh, it, it's a regulated environment, but also there's ongoing uh, assessment of AI and the potential risk, assessing what the risks are, mitigating those risks, audit trail, so accountability can be, and, and liability can be uh, assigned, and verifiable, verifiable adherence regulations, right? And all of these things increase trust, uh, reduce risk, make it insurable, which gives human more comfort in this new technology. Uh, Kurt, any, any additions to that? No, I'm, I'm 100% on board. This, this particular area is more of your, your forte, so I'll let you kind of run with it. It's, uh, but, but yeah, absolutely, I'm in alignment with you. All right, jump in, Kurt, then uh, anytime you, you, you want to jump in, okay? So, uh, so when we talk about regulations, so we talked about the we talked about the foundational ele- we talked about the foundational element here, which was regulations. When we talk about regulations, the things you know, uh, you know, one of the things with regulations is uh, if if you have two onerous regulations, then they uh, uh, you know they penalize smaller companies at the expense. Of, sorry, they penalize smaller companies, and and so you want to have the right um, uh, level of of regulations which don't penalize small companies or we don't limit experimentation. But at the same time, you know, the, the rule that we have in our mind is, uh, you know, uh, one always has to look at the human impact, right? If you're not looking at human impact of any AI decision, uh, then uh, you're probably not doing something right. So, so the framework, there's a matrix, which I haven't included here, unfortunately, but the matrix is, you know, um, if, if you have very good data, extremely good data, and the human impact is low, uh, or the societal impact is low, then you know you should feel very comfortable using AI. But if the quality of data is not good, and the impact on human beings is high, I would not be comfortable using AI. That's a red flag, right? So, uh, from a compliance adherence and from a oversight perspective, that's a heuristic I've built, and I'm very comfortable sharing that. Um, again, independent oversight boards. A non-circumvention, uh, because we saw some issues with GDPR, which thankfully are getting addressed now. Uh, we need to understand the 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 desired outcome of regulations, but also the second and third order effects. In terms of what the algorithm, algorithm should be, and I, I hope this will help answer the question that was asked. Uh, you know, I have a framework. I call it the NEAT framework, and I say, any time an algorithm is developed, it should be neutral, which means it should not be biased. And we are working on developing technologies that will, in an automated manner, uh, assess for bias. So, so that work is already underway. Uh, um, explainable, which means we should be explained 
why a decision was made and how. Accountable, which means uh, um, there should be an audit trail with cre clear line of liability, right? It shouldn't be, oh, this thing happened, we don't know why, so no one is to blame. And then trustable, which is we should be able to trust the algorithm we are deploying. And remember, I started with people process technology. I started with how open source is creating all these issues, and this is why this is important, right? When you have an open source system or when you have a code pulled from GitHub or other sources with very little attribution, well, maybe, maybe not, but you're pulling code created by someone else for some other purpose, and they're repurposing that for your own needs, um, are you really able to fully trust it? Uh, that's really important. And again, and Jerry, if I could just, Kurt, you, you, uh, if I could just jump in there, and I think that uh, absolutely when you're talking about the development of the code in the first place, but I wouldn't be a, a good cyber engineer if I didn't bring up the cyber threat issue of this. And I think as we look, kind of as cyber has evolved over the, over the last 10 years or so, you know, early on it was the retail breaches of the credit card theft, and those those were the big concerns. Uh, so it was the confidentiality of information, right, that was exposed. And then more recently where we see some of the larger, the manufacturing uh, business interruption exposure and some of these other other issues with the ransomware and so on, um, it's more of the uh, of the availability of systems, right, and, and that issue. Going forward, what's the biggest concern with cyber is the integrity of the algorithms. So these algorithms that have been developed around, uh, you know, be it narrow or more, you know, deep AI, can we rely on them? Is, is this the new, the, the next frontier in cyber crime is actually altering the algorithms? and then creating ransom or whatever extortion off of that. So the integrity of it is not just what you plan, but also are, how have you hardened your, your algorithms and, and, and so on so that they, they can't be altered by outside actors? Yeah, I mean, act of commission versus act of omission, right? So, so the act of commission being cyber attack, uh, intentional malfeasance, <coughs> whereas act of omission being uh, the algorithms are designed in a manner which were not robust. So absolutely, thanks, Kurt. Absolutely. Um, yes. Bringing back into uh, people's process technology, right? So uh, you, as uh, as, um, as 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 uh, from an organizational perspective, what can be done? You know, so from a people's perspective, like I said, I'm a big believer in the need model development, uh, you know, code of ethics. But then the other thing I call it T, or T E A, which is training exercise accountability, which is from a uh, you know we. Most organizations do a fairly good job of training people on cybersecurity and, and phishing emails and all of those things, but I think they do a really bad job in, in, in testing them or exercise, and then almost they almost never do anything in terms of accountability. So I don't see I, I see a scenario in, in the very near term where uh, you will have this framework adopted in organizations where, in addition to training, there'll be regular exercises, right, which is, uh, you know, uh, sort of tests of their employees to ensure they understand and adhere to the training, and then accountability, where uh, in their uh, annual reviews, the cyber hygiene becomes part of the review process. And obviously, culture of vigilance and empathy, empathy, I, I emphasize empathy here. And then from a uh, process point of view, um, you know, the human in the loop is one of the most important things, right? Uh, in a lot of situations, even in insurance, you're moving through straight through, straight through. Uh, uh, you know, that's the buzzword right now in the industry. But I think human in the loop is really important, and, and we cannot ignore that. We should not ignore that. AI should not, should not erode or devalue human experience, and there's a tendency among us technologies to do so, and we have to be very cognizant of that. And then finally, from a technology point of view, uh, regular stress tests and a very thorough and regular review of source code, open source code especially, uh, which I can tell you from personal experience, uh, almost no one ever does. I mean, uh, we are not really testing it at scale. Kurt? No, I think that's interesting because the idea of open source code in the first place was was that you would have all these eyes, right? Everybody in the world would be able to see your code and be able to assess it for, for issues and so on. Uh, but going back to your accountability issue, I, I concur with that. Uh, and, and we certainly see that. You, you use the example of like phishing email training and those, those kind of things. What I do say, you know, in the introduction, they kind of talked a little bit about, you know, the fact that on a daily basis, I'm looking at 
at companies and, and how they're mitigating their risk from a cyber perspective and so on. And, and recently, I've actually seen a shift in this trend, and I've actually had a couple of companies recently that have really upped it on the accountability side. So they're starting to hold employees' feet to the fire and saying, look, uh, this, this, you know, your failure to recognize phishing emails is not just an IT security issue, and it's, it's becoming an HR issue because it's so integral and so critical to the, uh, the viability of our company, right? If we can't get our employees to, to work with this technology without compromising our systems, uh, it becomes a, an organizational issue, it becomes an HR issue, and if you don't, you know, you're given two shots and then you're out kind of thing. Um, so I think there, there's definitely a shift towards the accountability, but it is very slow going. There's a lot more emphasis on the training and less on the, on the back end, as, as you mentioned. Absolutely, Kurt. Yeah, and, and again, open source, I think. Uh, they're open source, which are part of the um, uh, GNU and other libraries, but there's open source uh, that's part of GitHub that may not always be peer reviewed, but which is also used uh, in a very uh, regular manner by data scientists. So. Uh, but, but, but you know what? I mean, th there are opportunities, right? So I think from an insurance point of view, I think we as an industry will need to play a bigger part. We will have to play a bigger part, and we will play a bigger part. Uh, you know, um, and, and the, the tendency we have is to look at new risks and try to force fit them into um, in, uh, force fit them into old paradigms, right? So when we created the cyber product, we made it look as similar to an existing product as possible, right? And, and what we're realizing now, it was not always the right decision. And, and similarly, we, we are going to see more risk. Um, uh, and I'll tell you, at SwissRe, we are working on new products. So every risk we talked about, everything we've talked about, we are creating solutions for that. And, and, and so if any one of you has any questions on some of the things that we're working on, or want to do a POC with us, want to experiment with us, do reach out. Because I think, this is my personal opinion, not necessarily Swiss Re, I think uh, cyber and AI risk will be the biggest single risk of the 21st century. Uh, and I have absolutely no doubt about it. But single risk uh, in, in the PNC space, uh, I'm not talking about life and health. So um, uh, this will be really big. If we are smart about this as insurance companies, we will play a bigger role in this and we will take advantage of opportunities if we don't address this right now, it will be the big techs who are coming into it who will take control of it. And you're already seeing uh, products and solutions from Comcast and, and Norton and others where there's almost a uh, sort of a uh, warranty slash risk management slash insurance type of product without any insurance involvement. So we need to be cognizant and we need to be aware of this opportunity. We also need to be aware of the fact that we are somewhat blind right now, but we should be able to take steps despite being not fully clear. So if we take the right strategic steps, we will be okay. Um, so I'll, I'll make that offer. Do reach out to me. Um, and then Kurt obviously has a lot of experience in the cyberspace. Kurt, you, you, you want to add your bit here? No, I think I think you, you nailed it, right? And and uh, you know when we think about you know, the types of questions, or, or I should say, who's asking the questions, we we tended to get, at least I tended to feel questions in this space more from the from the cyber side of the house, right? So I think that the dedicated cyber insurance line of business and and so on. But more recently, we're getting these questions and these concerns. Uh, cross lines. So we're having, you know, the heads of casualty and property and all these are all, and, and it's not just us. This is, I mean, if you go to an industry event, you go to an advise and adventure, I mean, this is, it's a buzzword. Everybody's talking about this shifting cross lines. Everybody's worried about this now is, is the new, uh, kind of the new frontier that needs to be tackled. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's refreshing that, that you and, and, and other folks here at Swiss Re um, are, are working on solutions in this. Perfect. And, and finally, I'll leave with a, with a promotion, which is basically we do realize that it's important for us insurance executives uh, to be knowledgeable about data science. So we have partnered with MIT at, at SwissRe. We have partnered with MIT uh, to launch data science training for insurance executives. And, and so uh, we have taken the uh, MIT content that they're teaching to, to their masters of business analytics students, and we have sort of condensed it and simplified it for business executives. Uh, and, and we have launched that training. We already had one successful run uh, last month, and so we are excited to offer it to our our friends in the industry. Uh, that sort of ends uh, my 
and, and uh, that sort of ends our sort of presentation. So happy to take uh, questions. Jerry, thank you. Jerry, thank you. Kurt, thank you very much. Uh, we have received a lot of questions throughout the presentation, uh, but I first want to acknowledge that the second poll, uh, we had a malfunction with the second poll. So to our broker friends out there, uh, not everybody selected brokers will be impacted most by AI. So uh, all good there, and apologies for that. Um, so on it was our AI algorithmic bias. <laughs> yeah, one of our audience members said the, the AI is taking over, uh, which was hilarious. Uh, so yeah, I think a number of questions have come in, and I'll just distill it down to uh, a simple one, which is, is AI coming to take all of our jobs? Uh, that, the generally. answer is yes and no. Yeah, so the answer is yes and no, right? So, um, um, you know, um, if, if you if you if you if you talk to if you talk to um, if you talk to uh, if, you know if you listen to Elon Musk or Bill Gates, uh, they will say yes. This is the single biggest risk to humanity. Uh, uh, if you talk to uh, Stanford. Uh, uh, Human AI 100 initiative, they, uh, or if you talk to Accenture or McKinsey, they will say no. This also presents opportunity because industri industrialization didn't get rid of human beings; it just created more opportunities. But like I mentioned before, you know, human beings have the physical body, their mental capacity, and 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 at some point of time, and then there's a creative piece of it, right? So the mental pieces, logic and creation, but at some point of time, uh, human beings have a finite amount of capabilities. And if machines do the, hum the physical work, AI does the mental work, uh, you know, we, we, we have to start thinking about it, right? I don't want to be pessimistic and say, oh, each one of you start worrying. I don't think that is the case. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, that uh, uh, AI is a dual-edged sword. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, and I think that, yeah, I, I was just going to add on that. I think that as we look, certainly there's going to be certain industries or certain certain career paths, right, that in the near future are going to be more impacted than others. Um, and, and to Jerry's point, I think it's going to shift. And, and I just look at my own personal feel with, with cybersecurity and, and having to go hands-on and, and analyzing risks and so on. You know, as we shift more towards algorithms and, you know, big data and all that, you know, my personal job is more towards how do we develop these algorithms, how do we inform these and create these algorithms to automate these tasks. So I think for a lot of us, you think about the, the insurance community, right, the brokers and so on, we're going to be using our expertise to do less hands-on and more to help work with the engineers to develop the algorithms and so on. So I think it's just a shift in the way you're using your expertise for a lot of industries as opposed to completely eliminating it. We had an interesting question come on, uh, come in about um, AI's use to effectively audit or evaluate a third party's AI system. Is that something that's um, currently out there or under consideration? Yeah, it's not out there right now. This is exactly one of the projects we are on. Uh, we actually have a POC. Uh, we are uh, on it uh, next Thursday. Uh, so uh, we remain very bullish on our ability to do that. We are working with a uh, with a best in breed uh, technology partner on that, uh, where uh, you know we are jointly collaborating uh, on on this project. Uh, you know, all I'll say is, um, you know, if this is of interest to you, reach out to uh, reach out to your course of counterpart, and then you know we can get, we can be connected. But this is something uh, we'll be talking more and more about, hopefully. Uh, the POC goes well next week, but something we'll be talking more and more about next year. Thank you, Jerry. Um, uh, not, next question. Every company is developing AI for their own purposes. Should we trust those decision-making abilities equally? No. First of all, if every company is building its own, its own AI system, uh, it's doing something wrong. Everybody should not be building their own AI systems, right? Uh, and, and that's entirely new, uh, that's entirely different debate, right? Uh, the second piece is, if you are building an AI system, um, should we automatically trust it? If you're a Google or a Facebook uh, or a State Farm or Liberty Mutual or Swiss Re, the answer is no. The AI by itself is dumb. Uh, uh, and, and to a certain extent, even the best or the most well-meaning data scientist uh, doesn't always have control over the output. 
as the data changes, as the machine learns, there's a thing called model creep. So it might turn out to be really good in the beginning, but then it'll start learning. And as Kurt gave a really, really good example of the Microsoft chatbot, how it became racist within a day. I think it was within 24 hours, uh, right? So, you know, um, uh, it, 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 it sort of machine learning algorithms are the same way. So there's no such thing as I've built a great AI, I've built a great model, I'm going to go to bed, sleep, and it'll all be fine. No. It's almost, so the concept that we talk about is just like this telematics in cars, we talk about AI telematics. You have to keep monitoring it day in, day out, and then keep assessing. It's not just its performance. Every company probably assesses performance. You also have to assess its creep, also assess, uh, assess its, uh, you know, bias on whatever uh, scale you want to look at it, assess its impact. And that's one of the things we're working on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just going back to that, the History Channel did a, did a show a few years ago called Nanobot Oil, and they were talking about uh, basically using a, a, a army of nanobots to clean up an oil spill. Um, but in their scenario, you know, a minor programming error caused the, the nanobots to consume all carbon-based objects like fish, plankton, coral reefs, and so on, instead of just the hard hydrocarbons, right, that are in the oil. So I think, you know, just relying on the self-policing is not going to be that. I think, we're, to, to Jerry's point, first of all, it's very, very complex. So we're seeing organizations really rely on open source centralized development of the core AI initiatives and, and then kind of building on those. Uh, but I do think that that regulatory insurance even oversight. I mean, you think about what what's, uh, the insurance industry is doing for, for cyber uh, security right now and driving a lot of the what companies are doing if they want to get cyber insurance. I think that's going to be a driver as well. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, there were two questions on um, just a, requesting an elaboration on data lineage risk. Would you both be able to address that? Yeah, I mean, listen, um, uh, so, so data lineage range is really simple, right? So traditionally, we've been talking about the four Vs of data, right? Volume, ver veracity, uh, variety, uh, and, and there's one more V, right? So those are the four Vs talked about. The, the V that no one is talking about is uh, virtuosity, right? Which is how virtuous is the data? So I'll give an example. If you are subject to uh, uh, the, the CCPA in California, well, everybody who deals with anyone in California is, is, is under the purview, or if you're a part of GDPR regime, you know that if you have the deep pockets and you're using some data for some purpose and that data is not permissible, you have either collected it incorrectly, harvested it incorrectly, so harvested it incorrectly, uh, stored it incorrectly, uh, kept it incorrectly, where you should have deleted, you still kept it, and you have used it incorrectly, you face a real liability, and that's data lineage risk, which is how virtuous is the data. And when we talk to vendors, uh, when I talk to vendors at least, that's the first question I ask. How did you get the data? Was it, and I actually ask for, do you have, if, if they're saying we did web scraping or this and that, I ask, actually say, show me the legal opinion that you have that shows that this data you collected is culture, right? I want to see the legal opinion. So it's simple as that. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so that, that concludes the, uh, the program for today. I want to um, first just share with the audience, before you go, please let us know what you thought of the webinar. So I put up a, a poll here. This one will work. Um, and my opinion is any webinar that incorporates a Star Wars reference is a good webinar. Uh, but I'll leave that up to you. Um, and so again, thank you, Jerry Gupta and Kurt Ostriker for leading us through a thought-provoking and engaging discussion today. That was fantastic. And I also want to thank you, the audience, for spending the last hour with us. If you have questions or want to connect with us, please feel free to reach out. We're happy and would love to continue the discussion with you. In the coming days, we'll be sending a link to the recording of the session in case you want to rewatch segments or share with colleagues. And lastly, our programming will continue into 2021. We encourage you to reach out and share your thoughts and topics of interest that we can deliver to you to support you in your job. Stay tuned for invitations. And I'd also highly recommend following Swiss Re Corporate Solutions on LinkedIn so you don't miss event announcements and thought leadership content. And with that, I thank you all again for joining us and wish you and your families 
a happy and very healthy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you.